September is a very busy time for new PC releases as things start to ramp up for this holiday season. The next few months are looking pretty exciting with all of these new games to play. As usual, I'll be focusing this list on the releases that I'm most interested in and am most likely to play, which predominantly are the RPGs, MMOs, and shooters. Those are just the genres that I enjoy the most, but there's plenty else coming that didn't make my cut of 10, and I'll be sure to touch on those as well in case your tastes don't align with mine. On top of that, we've got a handful of betas playable this month that I think are worth mentioning as well. So yeah, like I said, it's a real busy time. And with that, let's go ahead and jump into and check out the top 10 best upcoming PC games to play in September 2021. As usual, we'll be doing this in order of release date, so don't get mad at me if your favorite game wasn't at the top or the bottom of the list or wherever the hell, it doesn't matter. It's just the release date, okay? <laughs> Starting things off, we've got Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. This is an isometric party-based CRPG and sequel to Pathfinder Kingmaker, which is one of the few existing Kickstarter success stories. The series is inspired by classic RPGs like Baldur's Gate, Fallout, and Arcanum, and you can really see that inspiration in this game. In many ways, Kingmaker felt like a modern spin on those traditional formulas, and boy, did it work. Overall, the game was well-received, in fact, at this moment, its score sits at mostly positive over on Steam. Now, with the follow-up, Wrath of the Righteous, they are hoping to take what players enjoyed about Kingmaker and expand on it with a brand new story, a new world to explore, and various new and improved features. The game's story has us adventuring to the World Wound, where this opening of a rift to the abyss has unleashed an all-consuming terror across the land, and our mission is to form a party of adventurers, but also build up an army and push back the demons. Exactly how we do that, though, is entirely up to us. The game is going to have an in-depth character creator. You'll be able to pick from a handful of pre-made options or build your own character, selecting their class, race, skills, spells, feats, and even things like their patron, their deity, and their alignment. If you're really into character building and fantasy games, it looks like you'll have tons of options here. As you play through the story and explore the world, you'll come across various potential allies that you can recruit into your party. There are over 10 of these in the game, each with their own backstories and specializations. So if you need a healer, a mage, a warrior, etc., you'll be able to find characters to fill those different roles and flesh out your group. Combat comes in two different varieties. There's the real-time as well as a pause and turn-based combat. So you'll be able to switch between these two on the fly, allowing you to either take things slowly, planning out every move, or just go in quickly and see what happens, which is tend to, uh, tends to be how I play these games. And like any good RPG, there's going to be a range of possible paths and outcomes for every playthrough. But it goes beyond just like picking different dialogue options or whether someone lives or dies in a particular scenario. The game has this system of mythic paths, which are sort of like specializations that also play into the narrative. Wrath of the Righteous also introduces this crusade system, which is said to add a new strategic layer of gameplay. You'll be granted command of this army that you'll build as you play through the game. If you've ever enjoyed classic RPGs like Baldur's Gate, the Pathfinder series looks to be a modern updated take on that formula. Last year, I briefly played and enjoyed my time with Kingmaker, so hopefully they're able to deliver here on the sequel. Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous is coming to PC on September 2nd for $49.99. It's also going to be available on Xbox and PlayStation consoles in March of next year. I already know the next game on this list is going to ruffle quite a few feathers. I totally get why, but from what I played a, a few months back, this is actually looking like a good game. I'm talking about Vampire the Masquerade Blood Hunt. Now, this is a vampire-themed battle royale that is set in the Masquerade universe, that last part being what has some people so upset. The original game, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, is a single-player story-driven RPG, basically the polar opposite of a battle royale. You combine that with the fact that Bloodline 2 looks to be stuck in development hell and not coming out anytime soon, the release of this battle royale spinoff is is leaving many fans of the franchise uh, a little bothered, to say the least. But there are two points here that I think are worth mentioning. One, like I said, the game seems pretty decent. I took part in a test for Blood Hunt a little while back, getting to play the game for a few hours, and I honestly really enjoyed it. But point two, and probably more importantly, is that this isn't being developed by the same studio that ma is making Bloodlines 2. It is set in the same universe, yes, but it's not the same development team, nor is it pulling from the same resources. 
development of these two games are unrelated beyond the fact that they share an IP. Uh, anyways, the preamble about people mad about this game aside, let's talk about Blood Hunt. Like I said, it's a new battle royale set in the Vampire Masquerade universe, but it's a lot more than just vampires running around with guns. They've managed to put a lot of vampire theming into the game's systems and mechanics. For starters, there are six classes, each from different vampire clans, with their own unique passive and active skills. When I played the game, I tried the Prowler, who could go invisible, send out a cloud of bats to spot enemies and track down wounded players by following their blood trail. Each of the other classes have their own unique set of skills as well as one common clan skill. Matches take place on this map that is set in Prague. It's got numerous notable landmarks based off of the real world location, but with a bit of masquerade fantasy tossed into the map as well. Once you spawn in, you'll go around doing all of the usual battle royale things. You run around picking up uh, weapons, items, and consumables. There's also a big emphasis on verticality being a vampire, you can scale the walls of every building, which makes traversal really simple. And as you go around looting, you're going to come across various NPC types. There are docile pedestrians and hostile soldiers that you'll have to avoid their line of sight and gunfire. You can feed on those NPCs, which will either heal you or certain ones will give you powers that last an entire match, like reducing ability cooldowns or increasing your health and damage. There are also boss NPCs that you can take on for special gear. And then they play into the mass Masquerade fantasy a bit, even though it's a battle royale, they try to follow the, uh, hey, we're keeping knowledge of vampire secrets. They'll put you at a severe disadvantage, basically, if you get spotted doing something suspicious, like killing an NPC. It puts you in this blood hunt state for some time, which makes you visible through walls to everyone else in the game. And yeah, all of that other stuff aside, it's a battle royale. So you've got this ever shrinking play space, other players to fight and try to eliminate with the ultimate goal of each match being survive to be the last one standing. So Blood Hunt is coming to Steam Early Access on September 7th. It is going to be free to play with the usual promise of not selling power, cosmetics, and battle passes only. And yeah, like I said, I really enjoyed playing the game earlier this year. Um, I am most likely going to jump in and check out this Early Access release. The next game on this list is probably one of the more unique looking titles that I've seen in a while. This is called Lost in Random. It's a gothic fairy tale inspired action adventure game set in the Kingdom of Random, which is a world ruled by a wicked queen and divided into six twisted realms with their own set of rules. We play as Even, who with her companion Dicey ventures out on a quest to save her sister Odd. Even and Odd. The naming of these characters is on point. Uh, the game has us exploring Random's mysterious cobbled streets, going through each of its twisted realms, meeting its unpredictable residents, and taking on a variety of strange quests. And it also offers a unique blend of tactical combat, card collection, and of course randomness. So on the journey, we will find and collect coins that we can use to trade in at special vendors to get powerful cards. And then when the combat takes place, which happens like on these giant board game style arenas, we'll pick at enemies using our trusty slingshots, knocking away these energy cubes that power up and let us roll dicey, which will then freeze time and let us play our collected cards, unleashing all sorts of different powerful attacks, abilities, enhancements, and combos. While the game does look to have a big focus on the storytelling and the world building and the adventure. From the trailers I've seen, the combat I think also looks pretty interesting as well. But definitely what stands out the most for me is just the look of everything, the characters, the animations, just the overall visual presentation. It is wearing that Tim Burton inspiration right on its sleeve which isn't to diminish the work of this game's artist, like it is meant as a compliment, and this game definitely has its own unique spin to it, but I can feel the inspiration for sure. So if you're in search of a story-driven adventure game, uh, it, this is really interesting looking, and you might want to keep your eye on it. Lost in Random is coming to the PC, PlayStation, Xbox, and Switch on September 10th for $29.99. Next up is Aragami 2, a third-person stealth action game where we play as an assassin with the power to control the shadows. The original game launched in 2016. I had never heard of it, but it seems like it was fairly well-received. It's got very positive scores on Steam right now. Now, with Aragami 2, they say they wanted to create an experience with lots of new features 
features while keeping the spirit and gameplay of the original. They're going to be focusing on the two main pillars of combat and the co-op gameplay. So first and foremost, this is a stealth game. It offers lots of different tools to help you sneak around the environment and take out enemies from the shadows. You can move through vegetation, hide behind objects. You have a double jump, a dash, and the ability to mantle, even a teleport that lets you go to most ledges pretty quickly. All of which is uh, going to let you stay out of sight as you traverse the map trying to complete various objectives like collecting these scrolls or taking out certain opponents and then also trying to get close enough to enemies to perform takedowns. On top of that you have your shadow powers. These are basically magic. Uh, there are ninja hacks that will let you spot enemies hidden behind walls. There's a ranged takedown. You can pull targets towards you, summon decoys, or even go fully invisible for a short duration. The game will have eight shadow powers and 16 passive abilities in total, all of which can be upgraded to fit your preferred playstyle. You can increase your stealth potential, or if you prefer, focus on the action combat. Even though stealth is the main priority in this game, Origami 2 also has a robust action combat system. With all of the elements you expect, there will be various attack types, there's a camera lock-on, finishers, you can block, dodge, and parry. They really wanted to flesh out the non-stealth combat if that's how you wanted to play, or for when you get um, caught out of stealth. And maybe one of the coolest aspects of this game is that it fully supports cooperative play with groups of up to three, letting you do all of this sneaking around as a squad of ninjas. It even has a tagging system so you and your teammates can know what, what enemies each of you are going after. They say that maps in Origami 2 are significantly larger than in the first game, and also include various collectibles and loot to get, which plays into the game's weapon and armor crafting. Uh, this game definitely, from what I've seen, uh, seems fairly simple from its presentation to its systems, its graphics, but it all looks fairly well done. And like I said, the original game was well received. Like it's got a pretty positive reception online. Also, it kind of reminds me of one of my favorite games that I played as a kid, which was Tenchu. This kind of feels like a modernized version of one of those, which I can get behind. And it is moderately priced as well, available th for $34.99 and coming to the PC, PlayStation, and Xbox on September the 17th. This next game was a standout on last month's list, but ended up getting delayed to September. And so I'm also gonna put it on this month's list. I'm talking about Kenna Bridge of Spirits, a story-driven action adventure game where we play as a spirit guide tasked with cleansing a mountain village overtook by this mysterious corruption. Just like with Lost in Random, I think this game's visuals are amazing. Uh, even more so, honestly, Kenna blows me away. There's something super appealing about the look of this thing. The main premise, once again, is that you are tasked with clearing the corruption and restoring this village. You'll do this by going around the environment, putting things back in order, picking up statues, growing crops, and just trying to make things normal again, basically. You'll also fight an assortment of corrupted enemies and large bosses using the game's action combat, performing light and heavy attacks, dodging, you've got this water shield you can use to parry, you can summon a bow and arrow to target enemy weak points. All of this also done with the help of the Rot, which are these tiny spirit companions that you collect as you progress through the game. The more of them you find, the stronger they get, unlocking all sorts of new attacks and mechanics. You can use them to distract enemies, to help clean clean up the environment, and even focus their power to enhance your own attacks. The game's gonna have a ton of exploration through this beautiful world. There's platforming, you can climb the side of mountains, dive into these deep cave systems, and set out exploring the wilderness. You'll find these inaccessible areas that require you to solve puzzles in order to get past. While you collect more rot, cleanse the corruption, fight enemies, and find out exactly what happened to the village. Um, it really is amazing to me that this is a brand new IP, just with how good the game world, the character the animation and the combat, how good everything looks. You would have figured that this was some like long established, highly funded franchise, but no, it's a brand new IP, brand new world, brand new characters. And honestly, I feel like we could be looking at a new hit in the making. It just, it, it seems that good. Kenna Bridge of Spirits will be coming to the PC and PlayStation consoles on September 21st. And then also I should note, this might be a deal breaker for some people. It is an Epic Store exclusive. Doesn't bother me that much, but I know 
some people really hate that. <laughs> Next up, we have got World War Z Aftermath. Now, this is a major update for the co-op zombie survival shooter that launched in 2019. The original game was a third-person shooter that had you and a team of friends fighting back hordes of zombies. And by hordes, I mean hordes. This game has you facing down massive groups of these fast-moving zombies. Really cool. You don't see this in a lot of games. Most zombie games, I mean, I look at the upcoming uh, Back for Blood, and it's just like all small scale compared to this but anyways beyond everything that was in the base game and the game of the year version of world war z aftermath is adding some rather significant stuff there are brand new locations being added like rome where you'll move through these cobblestone streets catacombs and even the Colosseum, or the russian peninsula of kamchatka i'm sorry if i said that wrong <laughs> uh, where you'll traverse an abandoned cruise ship and fight your way through a blizzard to recover this nuclear sub they've improved the melee system adding a bunch of new moves perks and new weapon types and including uh, sickles, cleavers, a fire axe, sledgehammer, and more. There's a brand new class, the Vanguard, who comes equipped with an electric shield, letting them charge into and stun the hordes of zombies. There are new enemy types, like these Plague of Rats, which can incapacitate your teammates. They're adding daily challenges with special modifiers, giving players uh, alternative ways to play to earn bonus rewards. They're adding a brand new first person mode, and all of this will include the base game and the game of the year edition of World War Z, which has a lot of new stuff and all told is going to include 23 PvE maps that take place across seven episodes, plus the additional content they've added over the last couple of years, like this horde mode, which looks pretty interesting. So World War Z Aftermath is coming to the PlayStation, Xbox, and PC on September 21st for $39.99. However, if you purchased either past version of the game, you can upgrade to Aftermath for $19.99, and this brings the game to Steam as it was previously an Epic Store exclusive. I mean, I gotta say that this looks pretty cool, especially for a mid-tier game priced at $40. I do want to mention though, the original launch of World War Z was pretty lukewarm. I think it was like averaging around a 60 to 70 on Open and Metacritic. Not exactly uh, crazy well-reviewed. However, I have heard that over time with patches and updates, the game has gotten better. Um, I know Aftermath isn't an entirely new game, but I felt like the changes were significant enough and this looked interesting enough that I wanted to put it on the list. Uh, but keep in mind that the original World War Z kind of got a lukewarm reception. Moving on, we have another game which is kind of new, but not really. I'm talking about Diablo 2 Resurrected, a remastered version of Diablo 2 and the Lord of Destruction expansion. It's got new, detailed, high-res 3D visuals, enhanced audio, and various quality of life improvements while trying to preserve the authentic experience and gameplay of the original, which apparently they've done by literally mapping this game over the base game's code. It was really interesting for me to read about this, even as someone who knows nothing about coding or game development. So the remaster takes the original 2D sprite-based game and moves it to 3D with everything being updated, new animations, dynamic lighting, textures, and visual effects. They basically wrote what they said was this physically-based renderer that is applied on top of the old game. So while you play, the base game of Diablo 2 is running in the background with these new visuals layered on top of it. Just really interesting. Yeah, I know nothing about game development or coding, but that sounds cool. Every item in the game also got remodeled from the icon art in your inventory to the 3D items that fall on the ground or are worn on your character. There is also a toggle if you want to swap back and forth between the remastered and or original graphics. All of the game audio was remastered. All 27 minutes of cinematics have been remade shot for shot from the ground up using new high fidelity art. There were also various quality of life improvements like the addition of a shared stash letting you easily transfer gear between characters. They increased the personal stash size, redesigned the UI, added an advanced stat screen, there's an item comparison tooltip, quick keys, and they even added auto gold pickup like what is used in Diablo 3. And maybe most importantly of all, Diablo 2 Resurrected will not replace classic Diablo 2 in Blizzard's shop as they're trying to not repeat the mistakes made with Warcraft 3 Reforged. Diablo 2 Resurrected will be available on PlayStation, Xbox, Switch, and PC on September 23rd for $39.99. I will say that my appetite tight for Blizzard games is pretty low right now. Plus, there's so much going on this month, I'm not sure that I'm going to be devoting too much time to a game that I already played 20 years ago. But I know there are a lot of avid Diablo 2 fans, and all signs are pointing to this being a good remaster 
from everything that I've seen and heard. The next game is Lemnus Gate, which offers this unique mix of FPS combat and turn-based strategy where you'll need to master the abilities of these deep space operatives and compete in four-dimensional battles, they say. This might be a way too big brain of a game for me. Uh, Lemnus Gate has two major components. There's the strategy and then the FPS combat. So not only will you need to focus on the immediate action of shooting your guns and using your abilities, but you'll also need to plan multiple turns in the future using your multiple operatives to try to set yourself up and better your opponent. And since this is a PvP game, you'll be doing this while competing against another real player. Matches consist of five separate rounds, each lasting 25 seconds and playing directly into the next. So the strategy involves taking what happens in the first round, learning from and adapting to it. You're going to use the, that knowledge to set up ambushes, uh, fix any past mistakes you made, or try to bait opponents into committing their own. And you'll have 25 seconds to execute your actions, whatever that's going to be, blasting the enemy, maneuvering your operatives, setting up a future move, and then a time loop kicks in and the next 25 second round begins. Each of these five rounds basically giving you a chance to alter the timeline and put yourself in a better position. There are going to be seven different classes in the game. These are the operatives we talked about. Each of them have their own unique abilities and loadouts, bringing different skills to the table. They can do stuff like a lay down damaging toxic waste in an enemy's path, slow time, letting you land a perfect shot. You can deploy protective orbs that you'll be able to pick up in future rounds. The game is going to have several different modes and match types, so you can do 1v1 or 2v2, online or offline, and three modes, including retrieve, where you scramble to collect this matter and return it to your gate, domination, which is all about competing to capture zones, and seek and destroy, where you try to wreck your opponent's resistors. Lemnus Gate is coming to the PC, PlayStation, and Xbox on September 28th for $19.99. Very moderately priced, and it is an interesting concept. Um, I think it might be a bit too stressful for my liking though. <laughs> and now we've reached the point in my list video where I talk about New World coming out. Uh, this might as well be a running joke. Like, hey guys, yeah, New World, it's finally launching this year, this month, this whatever. <laughs> but it's true, I think. Like, this is a real launch. Anyway, yeah, I've been uh, waiting for this thing to release for what seems like forever at this point. And jokes aside, I'm very happy uh, to have a game delayed if it means it's going to be launching as a better product, which it seems like that's the case. Compared to what they would have released if they launched last year in August 2020, New World today is leaps and bounds better. They've added expeditions, five-player instance dungeons meant to provide difficult group-focused content. There are six of these in the game currently, and we know there are more to come. There's Outpost Rush, a 20 vs 20 PvPvE battleground where players fight for control of strongholds. They added faction control points to the open world. These are capturable areas located in every territory, and players will fight for these, giving their faction zone-wide buffs. There's the addition of dueling, a nice consequence-free way of practicing PvP. There are two new endgame zones, Ebon Scale Reach and Reekwater. There are more of these coming. We already know about this new desert region that's being added. There's a variety of new enemy types like these swamp dryads and fiends, undead brutes, creepers, elite world bosses, a new elite enemy system which makes champion enemies more challenging by adding these unique affixes. We've also seen numerous AI changes like the addition of a threat system and an increase to the difficulty of AI when players fight enemies above their level. Numerous new weapons have been added, the spear, ice gauntlet, great axe, rapier, and there's more on the way in including this Void Gauntlet and Blunderbuss. They've made overhauls to combat, giving weapon skills independent cooldowns. There have been massive loot updates. The game now has more loot in it. It's better loot and it drops more often. They're making it more of an appealing loot game. They've improved customization with these attribute threshold bonuses, granting persistent bonuses to players for maintaining certain point values in each attribute. The list just goes on and on. I mean, they have varied up the questing system, added voiceover, there's fishing, Settlements got a visual update, they added discoverable fast travel points and achievement system, there have been various UI and quality of life updates. Honestly, I could make this video at least 30 minutes longer with all of the new stuff and changes that have happened to New World between August of last year and today. 
but I'm not gonna do that. Uh, suffice it to say, I think the game is in a much better position than it was back then, and I'm very excited to play. Of everything on this list, New World will undoubtedly be the game that I spend the most time with if its last two betas are any indication. It just checks enough of the right boxes to be a game that I really enjoy spending time with. It, it really is, in some ways, a, a really unique feeling MMO compared to the standard cookie cutter uh, design that we've gotten over the years. I'm not saying it's going to be better than those games. I certainly would like it to have many more features than it does right now, but there is something special about this. Um, I think at this point, my biggest concern is the combat going to get too repetitive over the long term, and will there be enough to do come max level to keep me interested? But frankly, even if both of those things happen, even if I'm tired of the rather simplistic combat system, and even if I run out of stuff to do in a few weeks, I think I'll be fine with it because I've enjoyed the hell out of the binge sessions that I've had recently with New World, and uh, no doubt I will be playing it obsessively for a few weeks when it launches later this month. New World is coming to the PC on September 28th for $39.99. And the final game on my top 10 PC releases of September is going to be Elyon. Uh, I think the biggest disappointment here is just that we have two MMOs launching within one day of each other. Even though Elyon didn't blow my mind when I played it recently, it did seem decent enough that I would have liked to spend some more time with it, uh, but ultimately I'm just not sure it's going to be in the cards. Let's talk about Elyon. Uh, in many ways, this looks to deliver much of the standard theme park MMO experience that you would come to expect. It's got a fairly linear leveling experience, moving you from zone to zone as you fall the main story quest line, but then also complete quests from NPCs and each of the quest hubs in the small towns in every area. The game features an action combat similar to Terra if you ever played that. The basic style is that you use these AoE and cleave abilities to take down clusters of enemies all at once. Uh, the combat I genuinely think is solid. It did feel good. It was responsive with nice animations and feedback. I can definitely see why people will enjoy this game for the combat a alone. And then of course it has every basic MMO archetype that you would want. There's a warrior, tank, mage, range, and healer class. Outside of that, Elyon also ticks all of the usual content boxes, dungeons, raids, world bosses, housing. On the PvP side, there are arenas, battlegrounds, and open world RVR. Basically, yeah, the game has most of what you would expect and want out of a theme park MMO, including a cash shop of, yeah, of course, yes, it has that. And like I said, um, when I I played Elyon, I, it seemed okay. I just think the timing could not be worse. I am just simply more looking forward to playing New World. I really can't commit to playing two MMOs simultaneously. So for that reason, Elyon is probably going to get a pass. But if, if you are interested, I think this game does have some promise and there are some real good strengths here, especially the combat. And this will be launching for PC on September 29th for $29.99. Now, as I mentioned, there are a handful of games that didn't quite make the cut, but I think are worth mentioning. Kataria Fables is an action adventure fused with RPG and farming elements. Plus, you can play as these adorable animals. I don't care what you say. It's not weird. It's just cute. <laughs> uh, Death Loop is a time loop themed FPS from the studio that made Dishonored. This probably should have been on my list, but I am just too much of an MMO fanboy, so sorry. Sable is an adventure exploration game with this cool art style. Here's Away, the survival series. This has you playing as a tiny sugar glider in your own nature documentary. Yes, it's another game where you play as animals. I like animals. Leave me alone. <laughs> and then finally, Rogue Lords, a dark fantasy vampire rogue-like strategy game also looks pretty cool. And uh, as I mentioned, there are a handful of betas that I want you to be aware of. Uh, Mortal Online 2, this hardcore PvP survival MMO, has a stress test from September 6th to the 10th. New World is gonna have an open beta if you needed me to convince you anymore. Try it out for yourself. This will be running from September 9th to the 12th. And then finally, Call of Duty Vanguard is having a beta from the 18th to the 21st. It's also got some early access uh, starting on the 16th as well. And with that, there you go. This video is way longer than I expect list videos to be. <laughs> but there, there you have it. Those are my top 10 upcoming PC games to keep your eyes on. And yeah, it's a pretty darn busy month. There's a lot going on, a lot of exciting stuff uh, to look forward to playing. 
I'm excited. I'm going to be covering uh, a decent chunk of this probably in the coming weeks between my news videos and maybe some actual in-depth coverage as well. We'll have to see. But there you go. Thank you for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed the list. Sorry it was so long or you're welcome. If you stayed to the end, thank you. <laughs> thank you guys for watching as always. Appreciate it. I'll see you in the next one. Take it easy.